origins of Greece in the field of medicine. The ancient Greeks embraced the concept of a healthy mind in a healthy body, and their view of medicine incorporated both physical and medical well-being. And Pendocilus, the Greek pre-Socratic philosopher, put forward the idea that all, all natural matter consisted of four elements, earth, water, air, and fire. This idea of four elements prompted ancient Greek doctors to establish the theory of the four hum humors or, or liquids. These four humors were blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile. The idea then developed of keeping these four humors in balance as a, as a necessity in good health. The ancient Greeks later linked humor to a market, a temper, a season, uh, and an element. The theory developed that when all the humors balance and minge properly, the person would experience a perfect harmony of the body. Consequently, illness until would occur um, when someone had to do too much or too little of uh, one of these humors. It was not until 2,000 years that, uh, later that the scientists concluded that the theory was false. You all know who Aristotle is and Plato? No? Oh man, I'll tell Dr. Elliot. Very good. Um, I think Thucydides, um, who lived around 460 to 395 BCE, concluded that prayers were ineffective against illnesses and pains, and that epilepsy had a scientific explanation that was nothing to do with angry gods or evil spirits. Yeah, I think that's it. Oh, I'm very proud of you girls. You all know your history. The Greeks brought the latest trends from Alexandria when the practitioners were greatly increasing their knowledge of the human body through the dis dissection and vivisection of condemned criminals. Did you all know that Greek doctors would carry out clinical observations or something that would be considered today as diagnosis? They would perform a thorough physical examination. Hippocratic books gave a guidance on how to do the examination and which to rule out the disease. Now as for treatments, that's a different story. Greek doctors became an expert in herbalist and prescribed the natural rem remedies. They believe that nature rather than superstition was the best healer. The Hippocratic folks, however, mentioned such uh, treatments such as take barley, soup, plus vinegar, and honey to bring them for chest disease. Uh, take uh, breathing pain inside by drinking a large sponge in water and applying gently. If the pain reaches the color bone, that's a different story. The doctor should drop blood near the elbow until the pain, until the blood flows bright red. Uh, pneumonia is a different story also. Pneumonia is treated by, by a bath that will be relieved pain and help to bring up the plant. The patient here must remain completely still until the end of the bath. When the patients get ill, sometimes the doctor would get things right, even if they did it for the wrong when attempting to balance the natural temperature of a patient, they kept a person warm when they had a cold, kept feverish and sweaty patients dry and cool, they bleed patients to restore the blood balance and purge a person to restore bile balance, for example, by giving them laxatives or diuretics or making them vomit. Greeks also recommended uh, music and the uh, theater play as a form of uh, relief for mental and physical illness. Examples include alternating the sound of a flute and a harp as a treatment for gout, using music therapy to soothe passion, and watching tragic plays as a psychotherapy. On the other hand, temples became health spots, gymnasiums, public bath, and sports a stadium. Some doctors would treat their patients and then take them to the temple to sleep. They believe that Hygieia and Panacea, the daughters of as foils would arrive to holy snakes like that one. <laughs> hey girls, come back here. 
from hygiene, we have the word known as hygiene. The snake today is a symbol of the pharmacist. Surgery then was usually limited to the surface of the body but was very specialized instruments. More sophisticated operations could be carried out such as removal of cataracts, draining of fluids, streptination, and reversal of circumcision. Wounds were stitched following surgery using flax, linen thread or metal pins, dressings were of linen bandages of, or sponges and either dry or wet that is soaked in wine, oil, vinegar, or water and kept moist with a cover of fresh leaves. Now, did, you, did you all know that the most important surgeons at that time were Halidorius and Antilius, but very little of their work survived? The most influential work on drugs was Materia Medica by Dioscorides of Anna Zorbas, written in the first century. In it, Dioscorides mentioned as a vast number of herbal and plant remedies along with these, uh, such medical cases, uh, classics uh, such as poppy juice and the autumn carcass uh, containing morphine, colchanine, respectively. He also described the health properties of certain stone if worn as amulets. For the public health, the Greek authorities, though, were not aware of the importance of public health. They did not promote what as the Romans did. For example, they thought uh, clean water supplies. However, the people believed in staying healthy. They were private and public bath. Some areas were naturally warm spring water. And now they look at the man himself, the main attraction of the show, the greatest physician of his time, the father of medicine. Remember when Doc Snorio discussed this in class? Good morning, class. So today we're going to talk about Hippocrates. So Hippocrates is a great physician from Moss and he is often called the father of medicine. Hippocrates was born on the island of Kos into a family of doctors. As the founder of the Hippocratic School of Medicine, he made major contributions to medicine that still persist today. The teaching at his school revolutionized medicine and established it as a profession and a discipline in its own right. Until then, medicine had been a part of philosophy and the practice of rituals, incantations, and the casting off of evil spirits. In his school, Hippocrates tried to separate medical knowledge from meat and superstition. Modern knowledge about Hippocrates' methods comes from the Corpus Hippocratum, a collection of 70 volumes that seem to have been gathered in the Great Library of Alexandria around 200 BC. While few of these books were probably written by Hippocrates himself, they are widely considered to be an expression of his medical teachings and philosophy. Hippocrates was not contented to simply work on the causes and treatment of diseases. He advised medical practitioners to be more serious about their profession and to have high moral standards. And this standard is embodied in what we call the Hippocratic Oath in which the doctors will swear to you. According to the oath, a physician is required to swear to use his knowledge only to save a life, not to take it, not to cause abortion, to maintain a professional relationship with patients, and not to reveal secrets given to him by the patients. Part of a mainland Hippocrates Hill, there is Miss Nathan Hippocrates. Hippocrates, like the other members of the Hippocrates and those from his school of medicine were the first people to describe and properly document several diseases and disorders, including a detailed description of clubbing of the fingers. Clubbing of the fingers is a hallmark sign of chronic superlative lung disease, cyanotic heart disease, and lung cancer. Until today, some doctors use the term Hippocratic fingers for clubbed fingers. individual had the following signs and they were not making any improvements, the doctor might suspect that they were close to death. A sharp nose, sunken eyes and temples, ears cold and drawn in with distorted lobes, hard and stretched and dry facial skin, and pale and dusky face. The and his school were the first to use the following medical terms. Accusation, 
is in chronic, endemic and epidemic, convalescence, crisis, exacerbation, paroxysm, peak, elapse, and resolution. In other words, the information and persistent in the modern medical usage include bios of life, genea, relating to birth of recent, gynae, meaning of a woman, of thalmos, and eye, pet, prepared for fair to a child, pneuma or breath, physis, which means being or nature. Sir, you look a lot like a poker you know that? I don't think this, that's totally wrong. Roman contribution to the history of medicine is often overlooked, but only Gallia and the Greek origin to leave the notable mention. Really? We left your new button in the spring. When mentioning the Roman influence on the history of medicine, the physician Gallen is the most illustrious name. This Greek, granted an expensive educate, education by his merchant father, studied in the medical school at the Pergamum and frequented by Asclepians. He moved to Rome by the 2nd century BC. Some of his contributions include he acted as a physician to the gladiators, which allowed him to study physiology and the human body. Later, he committed his findings into writing and produced many works about the human physiology and the treatment of uh, ailments. As his fame grew as a physician and a lecturer, he became the personal physician of three emperors, Marcus Aurelius, Commodus, and uh, Septimus Severus. Uh, Galen's observations of anatomy were based on animal dissection and vivisections, which he then used to interpret the human anatomy. He first anatomical observation of the humans were made during his time as a gladiator surgeon where the gapping wounds resulting in combat provided windows into the internal structure of a human body. Some of the other important personalities are Ascribius, Marius, Alius, uh, Cornelius, Silvius. Scribonius Largus from Sicily was a physician of Emperor Claudius and and Taraj, which visited Britain in 43 CE. Of the Empress's school, he wrote his compositions on drugs on the time, which include a salve for the arthritis, a recommendation for the trefoil plant against snake bites, and the turtle or dove's blood as a cure for epilepsy. Aelius Cornelius Celsius in the first century CE wrote an encyclopedia which included a part on medicine, on, of which only book 7, The Medicina, survives. In it, he mentioned and critically assumes tradition, traditional remedies such as old Greek practices of a steam bath perfumed with a herb of the mint family which aided sweating and revitalized the body, eating snakes to get rid of the abscesses, or even more bizarrely, the belief that drinking the blood of a slain glad gladiator cured epilepsy. The Soratis Gynecology, the first surviving medical textbook concerned with obstetrics, describes various methods for assisting childbirth. He describes the use of burning a uh, stool, a four legged arms and back that supports as well as a patent shape for opening the delivery of the baby. for personal hygiene by building public baths and washrooms. There were nine public baths in Rome alone. Each one had pools at varying temperatures, hot and cold baths. Some also had gyms and massage rooms. Government inspectors were vigorous in their enforcement for personal hygiene standards. The first buildings were half in the sink were the Roman military hospitals called Valetudinarians which were constructed in forts across the empire. These hospitals, such as the one at Chester's, were designed with small rooms opening off a corridor around a square or rectangular courtyard um, and primarily cared for the sick rather than those who were injured in the battle. The Romans did not really yet understand how germs are related to disease, but they did use many of the techniques that killed the germs techniques that were not reinvented until much later. 
For example, they would boil their tools before using and would not reuse the tools on a patient without reboiling. Ancient Roman medicine was split among different specialties. This includes internists, ophthalmologists, and urologists. All surgical tests were only performed by appropriate specialists, in which an ancient Roman med doctor's toolkit would include scalpels, catheters, and even arrowhead extractors. We all hope you enjoyed our presentation. Thank you for watching! Yay!